Okay then, uh, according to my watch, it's two, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jaron Langer. I'll be your course coordinator or yeah, the main lecturer for this course in reinforcement learning uh, for the summer semester of 2024. Uh, yeah, I'm taking over from last year from a, from a previous colleague, Olive, Professor Oliver Walshide, who currently works in the University of Siegen. So in order to keep the quality of the lectures where they were, if not improve upon them, we're going to be basing a lot of the lecture material off what he's already got and provided us with. So we're going to try and improve upon that and help you guys through the course, and hopefully we can yeah, impart some important knowledge upon you guys. So um, today... Uh, the agenda for today is we're going to handle a bit of administration. We're going to explain how the course is going to be run, how you guys are going to interact with the course. Uh, thereafter, we're going to handle a bit of reinforcement learning, a bit of history about it, what it actually is, what we mean by it, uh, some application examples, some nice to see, you know, something just to get a bit of motivation and sort of show you in what direction we take reinforcement learning. Because in the end, reinforcement learning is a very, very wide concept. It's a very, very wide research field. And we, as a control department, or essentially control department, are more interested in a specific application of it. And so while we will present you with enough information that you should have a good basics in order to go in different directions, at the very least, you will be able to understand where we take things. Um, thereafter, some main categories of reinforcement learning algorithms, and because reinforcement learning is a component of what's called optimal control theorems, uh, we will just do a small comparison to the more, uh, more well-known uh, optimal controller, which is model-based predictive control. Um, and then before we continue, today's lecture, at least the first two hours, is fully interactive, so at any point you have any questions, please raise your hand, ask questions. Now's the time to do it. Okay then, so um, I will be, so I'm the leader of this group, however I will be joined by quite a few colleagues, uh, Max, Daniel, Barney, Barnabas, Darius, Hendrik, Marvin and Mario, uh, three of which um, are currently sitting in front of you guys. They will help me out with most of the tasks, however you will see the others in tutorials and the Q&A sessions that will come in the future. So in general, um, if you want to contact any of them, myself included, uh, you can find our emails on the uh, department's homepage. So just a little bit of admin. Every bit of text you see in blue generally has a link to it. So when you're at home and you've got the GitHub page or the Panda page, hello, come in. Um, you can go click on these links and that will take you to where you need to go. Um, I think that covers everything administratively. Cool. Then, uh, so how are we handling the course? So following feedback as well as post-COVID and a few, yeah, um, bit of information that we picked up as well, as well as speaking to people in didactics, what we've settled upon is what's called an inverted classroom application. So this is a lecture to be held in English in a German university with students from all around the world. And so what we find is that it's often better to allow you guys to come to the material at your own pace. And so we will provide you with all the lecture content available as a video on demand, as well as slides on GitHub. So you can easily go through at your own pace, stop the, if you want to, for example, you're one of these people that you really want to focus on every detail and understand every step. You can pause the video. Maybe you want to go back to a previous lecture side. Remember, watch the video again. What did he mean by value function? And then you can come back to where you were. Or if you're one of those guys that listens at two times speed and enjoys, you know, doing this while you're jogging or whatever it happens to be, you're free to go about this course as you wish to. However, it is a programming course in the end. So the goal is, yes, you should understand the basics of reinforcement learning, but you should also be able to apply them. And so later today, for example, Barney will help you set up your laptops um, in order to begin Python programming. And thereafter, there are tutorials associated with each lecture. So you can watch the video, you'll then take that, what you've learned in the slides, and apply it to a practical example, which will, you can then run through with someone. So the way the lectures are held is there'll be a weekly Q&A session. So every week at 2 o'clock on Zoom, there will be a Q&A session which is not recorded. So if you have any questions from the lecture, hopefully try keep it 
to the lecture um, schedule, which we've uploaded and which are also found to be found in the notes. There you can ask all the questions on the lecture material. That won't be recorded. Thereafter, the tutorial will be presented where someone will walk you through the tutorial and hopefully explain any questions you might have with it. Is that clear? So the idea is to try and give you as much practical time as possible and time to try it yourself and then you can see how things work and then you can always go back and forward. So we're trying to make this as accessible as possible. Um, the Q&A session will be your consultation. Okay, that's it. And yeah, it's your responsibility to ask questions. So the Q&A sessions are only as good as you prepare yourself for it. So a lecture, yes. The problem is with a lecture, I come up, I speak, you listen, and then you go home with questions. Or you know, maybe you didn't understand something. With the Q&A session, you can listen to the lecture, find your questions, put them together, and get ready. So that's the, um, at least the intention. And yeah. So then finally, how will this course be evaluated? What, how will your performance be evaluated? There'll be one final exam. There's no intermediate tasks. You're free to do the tutorials or not at your own discretion. We highly advise you do perform them and try them out yourselves. It's a 45 minute exam. So part of the exam, before you come to the exam, we'll upload you a task. This might be something that you've seen before, something similar to something you've handled in your tutorials, but it will be a practical programming task. You will then, up to two days, I think it is before your scheduled appointment, you'll upload that and then we will evaluate it. The idea is to make sure that you have applied the theorems yourself. If it doesn't work, don't worry, that happens. Then you have the, uh, the examination and the appointment where you can explain why you think it done, didn't work. So part of it is 15 minutes will be to explain what you did, what you didn't do, what worked, what didn't, and why you went about your approach. And then the next 30 minutes will be you sort of explaining what you've learned in reinforcement learning to us in an interactive way with which we can figure out how well you understood the course. Is that clear? Cool. Uh, yeah, so there's just, yeah, if, um, that just clears up everything I've said. Great, so the schedule. So today we've got the introduction to reinforcement learning and then thereafter there'll be the Python, ex, uh, Python installation. Thereafter we begin with the course material. Starting from the more basic tabular methods, which you will get into and again are available, mark of decision processes and dynamic programming. Then you'll get into more, yeah, where we start getting more into Q-learning and deep learning and these other tools. But don't worry about what those things are just yet. You'll learn in due time. Yeah, so, good point. Next week will be, so from next week on, the lectures will be, uh, the Q&A sessions are only on Zoom. You should have received a link by now. Everyone seen the link? If you haven't received it, it should have been part of the email. Do, and on Panda, thank you very much. Do contact us um, and get hold of us and we'll try and get the information and appropriate links off to everyone. So. Some textbooks that you might find useful. First textbook upon which most of this lecture is based is the lecture book from Sutton and Barta. Um, there's a link with which you can access it. It's also available, I think, on Panda as well. So free to freely accessible. Go look at it, read it. It contains largely the same material we've covered. Thereafter, there's the reinforcement learning lectures, which you can access from David Silver. Um, the entire lecture set is available on the YouTube link. There's also, I mean, there's hundreds of lecture series available. Uh, just be careful because they, they often differ in terms of where their targeted application ends up trying to be. And then lastly, we have a textbook which is available in the library. It's not freely available. And that covers more optimal control in the form of both reinforcement learning as well as other mathematical formula and more complex controllers. So, uh, before I continue, so we'll be using Panda for announcements, general announcements, notifications. You can also asynchronously ask questions there using the tools that are already available in Panda. GitHub will be for the lecture materials, the lecture notes, and the tutorials. 
So your tutorials should be, most of them, I think, up to week six are already updated and available on the GitHub page. And then the rest of them are there, and they might change slightly as we move throughout the course. We update them relatively every year with the newer libraries and the newer um, functions that might or might not be available, as well as try and make them a bit more readable. So uh, that's the course framework. Are there any questions before we start getting into some of the material on how we're running this course or what's expected of yourselves as students? If not, let's move on. So what is reinforcement learning? That. Um, so this picture you'll see everywhere. Generally, when any, whenever anyone refers to reinforcement learning, that's the image which will come up. Reinforcement learning, um, you first of all, you have some agent. And I, reinforcement learning? Yeah, please come in. Try not to disturb everyone else. Um, you have your agent. Now, the word agent is very specifically chosen. The agent has agency. So the agent makes decisions. Whether how we eventually get the agent to make decisions will be revealed over the course of the next few um, lectures. Hopefully, over the next 14 weeks, you will have picked up enough information to understand how to make the agent perform its task. What will its task be? Well, the agent interacts with an environment. The environment could be something as simple as some two-dimensional map, like a chess game, a simple maze, or something like that. So we have demonstrated it with a maze. Or it could be a continuous control problem, say, driving a car, flying a helicopter. Whatever the environment is, the agent interacts with some action, you, on the environment. The environment returns to some observer or interpreter the state. So in the environment contains everything. It's basically when you're in a car, your car knows everything. However, what you as a driver observe when you're driving your car, you don't know which piston it's firing, how it's optimizing the fuel ratios. None of that's important to you. As an observer, what's provided to you is the speed and perhaps your mileage, what fuel you've got left. So from your observations, you are the, essentially the agent. What the interpreter will also provide, uh, what the interpreter can also provide you with is what's called a reward. This is some indicator of how well or poorly the agent is performing whatever the task happens to be. And this is very task specific and a uh, scalar quantity. These properties make most of your work or a lot of the work goes into actually designing a good reward function that achieves the goals you have. Because the problem about this entire loop is this is a computer program. And those of you that have worked with computer programs know very well the computer does not what you want it to do, but what you've told it to do. And so that's a very important point that you will hopefully learn. And that's why we hope that you guys will try the uh, the tutorials out and start getting a feel for this because you guys also are part and agent in your own learning experience. And hopefully we hope that you all can optimize your own reward. So um, key characteristics, there's no supervisor. So what reinforcement learning differs to other forms of machine learning is you don't have a supervisor to tell you, are you doing it right or wrong? Or what's the right way or the wrong way to do it? You simply get this value that tells you whether you've done it good or badly. So for example, if you're trying to train an autom autonomous car, or it won't know whether it's doing well or badly until it gets that reward function. So if it crashes into a tree, the car's in the tree, and you get your negative reward. And it's not like when you go, for instance, you've got a driving instructor, your driving instructor will tell you, don't drive the car into the tree. Unfortunately, with reinforcement learning, the agent has to learn it, maybe once or twice or three times. That's an unfortunate disadvantage, and hopefully we might show you how you can avoid crashing your car into a tree, but that is an inherent feature of reinforcement learning. It's data-driven, so unlike other optimal control strategies, it's not based off of a model. Okay, someone will get angry with me on that, but it's based off on experience. So in other words, you've got to experience something to know what to do in the future. It's discrete time steps, now that's not too critical for, say, a maze, because 
whether I spend six hours in one spot on a maze and then move forward, or whether I do things sequentially, it's more important when we get to linear systems. Discrete time enables us to better model and understand linear systems at least a bit easier. It's a sequential data stream, so it's not independent and, in, uh, it's independent and identically distributed data. The data follows the controller, uh, the uh, actors, uh, so the actions the act has taken. So it's, it does change over time. And so your data, for example, when you come to driving a car, the data when you start learning to drive a car, say it's in a parking lot with your father or some instructor, and he's gonna take you really slowly round, you know, you're not gonna exceed 20 kilometers an hour, you're then gonna drive in the city, and eventually you're gonna make it to the autobahn. And so that data changes as the controller's actions, actions develop. And that's also a uh, bug, uh, not a bug, but it's a component of reinforcement learning. And then, so the nomenclature we use, um, we use X to represent state, uh, reward is K and observations are Y. These are consistent with control engineering. Other lecturers online may use A as action, O as observation, and S as state. So there is some nomenclature differences. So when you do do your own research, keep that in mind. But largely, they're the same things. Let's how do I end that. Okay, so. What happens in each step? At each step, the agent is going to pick an action. So the agent is monitoring the, has the observation and the reward from the previous step, k minus one. It picks an action, u of k. It, yeah, receives an observation, receives a reward, and then it emits an, uh, yeah, emits an action. The environment receives this action, and then from this, um, um, action, from this action, it's updated, so you start in one point, you look at your environment, you take your decisions on the rewards, you make a decision, you process that off to the environment. The environment then tells you, okay, you're one step forward, one step back, and then that goes over to some interpreter. Your interpreter could be a sensor, it could be a camera, it varies quite wildly, and then you receive a reward, and then the time increments. So the, that's the very basic structure that you should be familiar with from control engineering. So, just some basic uh, definitions. Reinforcement learning is made up of two words. First word, reinforcement. Second word, learning. Now, reinforcement learning being a very wide category of research, it's largely humans trying to re or teach a computer to learn the way humans do. So it falls into a larger scheme of trying to help computers make the independent decisions, or not necessarily computers, but help actors make decisions or learn in the way that human does. So reinforcement is a consequence that will be applied that will strengthen an, organi an organism's future behavior whenever that behavior is preceded by a specific stimulus. And there are generally four types of reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, so for example, uh, if you've got a dog, when it does well, you might give it a treat, you know, that we understand. Negative reinforcement, you might give it less treats, so you enforce that it's done something wrong. Extinction, you're not necessarily killing your dog, but you might not feed it. Um, obviously, that's cruel in that sense, but in the context of, for example, genetic algorithms, you would prune off um, negative or poor agents, and then punishment, well, this would be equivalent to spritzing your dog with a little bit of water when he messes on the carpet, whatever it happens to be. So that's reinforcement. Learning, acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. Important things here is available from memory so you have the experiences Generally, as humans, we try and also include some form of a priori when we ourselves learn. However, when we talk about an agent, generally we'll build this up from some memory. So the agent will have experienced something, and then it can make sense of future problems and opportunities. And then from a control perspective, what we want to do is take this experience and use it to optimize our future rewards. That's the basics of optimal control, and that's how we will start to move 
from that. And this is inherently different from planning or model-based techniques. And that's the big thing I want to emphasize, and we will look at this later on in the lecture, but there's no planning stage. There's no look ahead. Model-based uh, model techniques, you say, okay, here's a model or here's a maze. I can look around and I can plan my route. Experience-based looks behind you. What have I done? What happened when I did X? And is there a way to make it better? So, just to give us some sense of scale about where reinforcement learning comes into the whole field of what's called machine learning. In machine learning, you have unsupervised learning, supervised learning, reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning, um, yeah, normally you have full knowledge, so you have all unsupervised learning, you start off with a full set of knowledge. So everything you need to know is contained in a database, and then you extract out the details that you need to do from it. Supervised learning, generally you'll give it like a model, so that's why regression is a great example. So if you apply a regressor, what you'll, uh, some sort of uh, regression technique, you'll say, right, I expect to have a model with these states, and then you tell the regressor to go ahead and map the data that it receives to those states. And then uh, reinforcement learning, um, you don't give it a model and you allow it to sort of explore the environment and build up these experience and hopefully learn from those experiences. We'll largely focus on what's called single agent problems. So single agent problems, there's one agent, one environment, nothing else disturbs the environment. Obviously, yes, you get disturbances, but there's no secondary agent that we can act upon. That's more multi-agent. So in the case of what I myself am interested in, single agent will be a single inverter. So a single inverter in a household, you want to convert the energy from your solar panels as, more, as efficiently as possible. Multi-agent would be you're trying to control the whole grid. So you've got hundreds of inverters scattered around a neighborhood and you're trying to control it. If you're interested in that, send me an email. We're constantly looking for people to do some work in that field. But that should at least clear up where reinforcement learning falls into the greater scheme of um, machine learning. Now, this here is a bit more of a diagram of where does this fall into the whole field itself of AI. Some people would say it's not AI. My predecessor felt it wasn't. I'm of the opinion that it is. It falls into it because AI is, even an if statement in a program, is a form of AI. It's, we're artificially creating some intelligence. Yes, we're training the computer, but it's all part of the same learning schemes. So. It's more of a nuanced argument than an actual science whether it falls into that. Specifically, it is machine learning. So machine learnings are is a subset of AI which algorithms can modify themselves through, without human intervention to produce a desired uh, output. So it will constantly modify itself as well as adapt its policy over time. So as I said, with driving, you are that is in a form that is a form of reinforcement learning. So you start off, you don't know what you're doing, and slowly you adapt your policy and decisions. So when you, when you start off, you've, you don't know how to handle the clutch, you don't know what you're doing with the accelerator, it's very jerky. After a while, you're doing 200 kilometers down the autobahn. So that's a good way to think about what machine learning is. Deep learning is a class of machine learning where you start building up these very large layered networks. Um, to extract more information. So this is where things like you start getting into very complex things like image identification, where you might try and identify people, actions, animals, things like that. What we will cover here, we will deeply touch a bit into deep learning. So later on in the course, you will get there. However, generally, when you start going in that direction of research, your computational requirements increase exponentially. So for most of this course, you will stay within what's called tabular methods and very uh, problems that are somewhat simple to handle with your everyday laptop. Thereafter, we'll briefly touch on to some deep learning concepts where you'll have maybe a few layers and a few neurons, and then you'll train the network to do something useful with that data. However, what you'll learn is that from your tutorials, the tutorials go, will go from solving themselves in 10 minutes to taking a few hours to come to a solution. And so that's why we don't spend too long there, but we just sort of let you have a look at it and peer inside what is a very complex thing. Um, 
yeah, however, in the context of what we do, our networks are generally quite small. So if you're trying to control a plant, you might have 10 layers, whereas if you're trying to do something like an image processing system, you need a, a, almost a, a neuron per pixel. And then you need to start building that network up. And so you can understand how image processing is quite uh, computationally heavy. So just then lastly, just to zoom out a bit further before we start getting into the specifics, when you go and you say, right, I want to look about reinforcement learning. So you go online and you type in reinforcement learning, quite excited. You're going to get bombarded with a whole bunch of topics because the field of reinforcement learning finds itself in applications in engineering, computer science, but also neuroscience, psychology, economics, and maths. And so each of these different fields have a very different objective. It all somewhat falls under the same logic and the same... I wouldn't necessarily say algorithms, but for lack of a better term, algorithms. The processes are similar, but the objectives and how they're optimized around these problems does differ. So, you know, if you go ahead and you look up something, we here, being in engineering and computer sciences, we generally stay somewhere here between optimal control, reinforcement learning. That's generally where we're going to focus on. However, you will find a few psychologists doing something try, trying to optimize or get people to behave themselves. Uh, you find this quite often in the field of crowd uh, mechanics, but we're not going to get there. We'll go there. So, any questions so far? So, I hope with what I've explained so far, you've got a rough understanding of what reinforcement learning is. So from this, you have a few basics. You understand what it roughly is. And then we, what we'll, we'll go into is a few applications as well as just a bit of a historic review. So historically, um, the field of reinforcement learning starts off with Pavlov, um, Ivan Pavlov. Um, his work is most notorious. Uh, you've probably all heard of Pavlov's dog. Basically, he discovered that you can train a dog to respond to stimuli. So what I think he did in... I might be wrong, but he would ring a bell every time he gave a dog a treat. And then he noticed that when he rang the bell, if there wasn't a treat, the dog would start to salivate. And this is used nowadays. If you've ever gone to dog shows, they train their dogs to respond to clickers instead of treats. So it's still in use today. Um, thereafter, Andrei Malkov, um, he's more known for creating the idea of how do we model and optimize what's called stochastic prose. Uh, stochastic processes, so things where there's a lot of random things going on. Now, you might think that doesn't necessarily apply because we often work with more definitive systems without uh, any form of randomness normally. However, in, if you ever operate in the real world, so you go from a simulation to an actual piece of hardware, there'll be something called measurement noise, and that's a stochastic process. And so we can still utilize these ideas in what we do later on. And then lastly came Richard Bellman, who looked at all of this and said, okay, how do you describe something optimal? And from that became the branch of where we started mathematically defining optimal uh, decision making. Cool. Then uh, just a quick history, um, because naturally you can go for hours, any history will take hours. However, if you wish to, there's a few uh, sources. There's um, chapter 1.7 of the Barter Sutton book, which you do have available. Um, there's a talk from Barto. There's a YouTube link. Um, as well as I've, we've provided you with a few um, papers, which you can use. If you ever decide you want to do some research and reinforcement learning, these are papers that you can use sort of as a stepping stone to uh, further publications and further information that you can find online. Um, so we would recommend, if you do want to dive a bit deeper here, some good resources to start with. Cool, so now we come to a bit of the fun part of the lecture, the examples. So for the examples, we'll start off quickly with the quickest um, and probably the most common um, example. So this specifically is what's called the swinging cart pole example. So it's a common problem in um, 
control engineering because it's a fairly complex problem to solve because you've got two equilibriums. The pendulum, so for those that don't know, it's, you can sort of see it here. What you have is a cart that can move left and right on a track. So your action is move it left, move it right. The pole itself has a mass and it's sitting on a pivot point on that cart. Now the objective is to get it from its one equilibrium where the car, uh, pole is hanging downwards to the second equilibrium where it's vertical. Practical applications, rockets. It's the same, roughly the same physics that you find in rocket dynamics. And segways, yes. <laughs> so that's the dynamics. Now if you try and solve this using classical control techniques, you might use something like uh, Lyapunov, um, Lagr sorry, Lagrangian dynamics and you'll use the Lagrangian dynamics to model the swinger point, and then you might have to switch to a different controller. So most of the classical approaches to solving this problem need you to design and spend time designing two different controllers, finding the switchover point, and a lot of fine tuning, and a lot of heuristic understanding, and you need a very well-trained engineer to get one of these cards to solve this problem. So, here we have a reinforcement learning agent. Now, what will happen is at first you can see it's not really doing anything. It's just sort of swinging about. Um, and then slowly after time, um, we can see it sort of starts trying, it starts figuring something out. It's, it's doing something. It's not what we want, but it's getting there. And at the very least, it's, it's closer to the objective than it was in the beginning. And eventually, well, it starts behaving itself, and we start getting close to the objective, and it's balancing the stick. And then it moves into the, um, after a while, it moves into sort of the fine tuning. So if you take this to your car analogy, in the beginning, it was in a parking lot, small movements, trying to figure out what it's doing, and slowly over time, it gets better to the point where, I think, should we get there? Okay, here's the final controller, perfectly timed then. And it gets the stick upwards and controls it. And I think, does he hit it in this example? Yes, good. And it can respond to stimuli. So during the training, it didn't, there was no stimuli or out, outside interaction, and yet it still learned how to handle these interactions and disturbances. So that is the power or strength of these sorts of controllers. Next example is something performed here by our very own department. Uh, namely Max over here. Um, the objective is motor controls. Okay. <laughs> um, what we're trying to do as a department is the motor control in the, of an electric motor. So you want to control the torque, you want to be it in an automotive application or some other industrial application. So what we have as an example is Max wanted to see if he could make teach the motor or teach an actor how to control a motor faster than it took our coffee machine to make coffee. Because this is you know, the important things by which we time our life, is the coffee machine. And so he starts off and it's very hard to see, the colors are difficult, however the link is available. And what he's trying to do is get the motor to follow the torque set point. And what we should see is at the end of this, the motor follows the torque set points and he can then enjoy a nice cup of coffee or you know, a snack. The important things we wish we would rather be doing rather than sitting in front of a computer. So there's a ton of examples. All of them are available. Um, here as links. So there's a few links here, uh, controlling electric drive systems, which I've shown you. Um, driving, uh, sorry, uh, what was it? Swinging up and balancing the car pole. There's also a playing strategy game, board game Go. Now this might be something you may or may not have heard of. Maybe it inspired your, you know, it got you thinking about it. If that's uh, Silver, David Silver. He's the man who actually managed to program that and program the uh, policy or the actor that played the board game Go. So quite a famous in the field. Uh, at, at Google DeepMind, Deep Mind, was it? Doing it uh, on his own. Yeah, but isn't he with OpenAI? <laughs> we can discuss that later. <laughs> people, but yes. People move around, yeah. 
people move around a lot. There's also a very interesting example. So I mentioned earlier it uses experience. So the nuclear fusion reactor plasma control. Nuclear fusion is one of these processes. In fact, they've been doing this for years. Nuclear fusion wasn't the first example. A company called, and I'm going to get it wrong, but they've been doing this on chemical plants for years, which is you, chemical plants in large processes are very hard to model. You've got a lot of interconnected systems and trying to create a singular model with which you can then design a controller around that is very, very difficult. So what happened specifically in this example um, is they trained an agent using a model and then they took that same trained agent and applied it to the real system. And then they let it learn further with that um, on the nuclear fusion reactor. So very interesting thing. The video link here is an hour long. So if you are going to watch it, be prepared for a lot of in-depth details. But you can go ahead and have a look. And then, of course, some of you might know ChatGPT. That's another thing. We will briefly cover how that's handled, I think, in the last lecture. We're not going to go too in deep, just generally because of the size and complexity of such a system. That could take its own lecture series to explain. It seems the mercury is dead. Cool. Is that, well, that should have been clear. Right, then basic terminology. Now we start getting a bit deeper into the weeds. So this material, what I'm going to cover at the moment, you will probably have to come back to sometime later in the course. Because as you go through, you might forget what's the different terms. So these are important things. The first thing, reward. Now you've heard me mention this a bit. We're going to briefly cover it now. This is probably one of the most, I wouldn't say complex, but it's, it's the art form that finds it's, that we have within um, reinforcement learning. So there's no fixed science around it. It's, there are techniques and theories on how you can improve it, but it is very much an art that you actually need experience to figure out and to sort of know what will work and what won't. Um, so what it is, is it's a real number or an integer and so it's a, but it's a single scalar, so one value, and it's either naturally given, so for example, if you play in a, a, a game like Tetris, you, the reward is how many points did you obtain during that game of Tetris. That's easy, it's already provided to us. Um, if, however, you're driving a car, you need some interpreter to say, okay, that was good or bad, so you might get points for driving smoothly, going in the right direction, and lose points for crashing into a tree. Um, and all that that reward tells you is how well the agent is doing at that time step, so at that evaluation point. So for example, an episodic task, which has a definitive end, like a computer game, there you will receive a point at the end of it, or in the case of driving a car, you'll receive a reward at that time step. However, it can be a bit more complex than that. For example, if you're doing a chess game, so you want something to learn how to play chess, the reward you know, could come at the end of it, either you won or you lost, so one or, no, or minus one, or you might try to say, okay, is this position better than the next position? So you might try and come up with some numerical value to estimate the value of being in that position at that point in time. So reward design is difficult and our task or the task of the agent as an optimal controller is to optimize or maximize the reward over time. This is different to other optimal controllers. Uh, for example, model-based predictor control tries to minimize its punishment. But that's in the end what we're trying to do is optimize or minimize something. The functions do change a bit. So that comes down to our reward hypothesis which is what we're trying to do is maximize the expectation of, reward, of the reward that we receive over time. That's the basic goal. So here's a few more examples. Positive reward, catching the pancake, 180 degrees. You know, you're flipping pancakes on the weekend. You might say you can get double the positive reward if you catch it in your mouth. But if it falls on the floor and the dog eats it, yeah, that's not necessarily a positive reward. I mean, maybe you are trying to feed your dog, but you know, that comes up to you. Stock trading is another example of where these sorts of uh, theories are trying to be implemented. So the reward could be your current stock position. Is it maximized or minimized? You know, you might say, okay, 
is my portfolio worth more or less? Um, playing Atari games, so as I said, Tetris is an example, driving a car, as well as um, classical control tasks, so following a trajectory. Are you on your trajectory? Is it working? Is it violating system constraints? So specifically, you might say, okay, is it following my ta uh, target con trajectory? But, for example, you're, you've got an autonomous car, and it's, yes, it's driving north, but it's swinging the wheel left and right, and you, you know, all the passengers are getting shaken around. So that's somewhat something that you might want to consider when you design your reward. So rewards can have many different flavors, different shapes, forms. So um, it might be delayed, so you might take an action. For example, you buy a, a stock, and the reward you only materialize later when it gains value. Um, strategic board games, it might be worthwhile in chess to sacrifice your queen in order to gain an advantage in position and win the game. Positive or negative, as well as you might have exogenous impact. So the example given here is a wind gust. So your agent didn't actually have anything to do with that, but it still produces a negative reward. And so that is obviously something that you'd want at some point the agent to be able to deal with, and at least in a way that it minimizes the effect from the sexagenous circumstance. So in the case of the inverted pole, um, uh, car pole problem that we saw in the video earlier, when the guy hits the pole, yeah, that's a negative situation. It's going away, but it minimizes that and brings it back. That's optimal control. And so... Your agent's learning process is heavily linked to the reward. The reward is the only way with which we describe whether or not it's a good or bad behavior that it's performing. So this is why the machines aren't going to take over the world anytime soon, at least not in the way that we think, because in order to do that, you need to very clearly and very well define this um, reward. However, be very, very careful what you ask for because you'll get it. And so the example um, that we're going to give here is the, we're just going to quickly look at the um, cart problem. So if you have, here's your cart with bounds over here. So it cannot exceed these boundaries. It's got some length. Uh, so did a piece of... It's got some length and an angle. And obviously, at some point, you can model there's a center of mass sitting over there. Now, I'm going to present two rewards to you. So this is the problem. Oh, wait, one thing further. X. So it can move in the X direction. Now, what happens, this, we will look at this as a periodic task. So if it hits the ends, the simulation ends and it restarts. So in a way, we will look at this as a periodic task. And what we'll do is we'll define the reward here is equal to minus the absolute value of alpha, or the angle. That makes sense. So obviously, as down here, when it's 180 degrees, it's going to be receiving a reward of 180. And then as it starts to swing it up and the angle decreases, at some point, it'll be 0. And so it'll reach essentially the highest value that minus the absolute value can reach. Can anyone tell me what will happen or why this might not work the way you expect it to? Can anyone see a problem with this? Mm -hmm. Is it that we don't take the actions into account? So it might, uh... Oscillate? Sure, that possibly could happen. We did see that the cart from earlier was quite excited, it was moving around quite a lot. And the velocity of the Yeah, so if it crashes into the end, that's also poor, but that's not necessarily what I'm aiming at here. Anyone else? Well, remember what I said, if it crashes into the sides, it terminates the event. What you might actually have is the agent might decide, well, you know what? The quickest way out of this is I crash into the side rather than I swing the stick upwards. And so you've just developed a suicide bot. 
So a somewhat better um, result would be something along the lines of cos, uh, I should have started this somewhere else, cos of alpha. And in this fashion, it's able to get a positive reward at some point. And so yes, at some point the agent might say, hey, you know what, it's somewhat times better to crash in the end, but at the very least at some point you can negate it. And so at some point it will start saying, hey, wait, there's a better way. I can get more points if I start reducing this angle. And slowly it will learn and then eventually solve it and you'll end up with an upright totem pole. Everyone with me on that? So, as we said, be very careful about how you design your reward. And there's no, I think there is no lecture or tutorial on it. There's so, it's one of these things where you need to have the experience. There's no, I don't even think there's any strong theories on how to do it. There's obviously people trying to research it and try and find a way to best create rewards. But in the end, it is still largely an art form. So that's why we highly encourage everyone here goes home and tries the examples and gain, gains that experience of what the different uh, reinforce, uh, reward functions and what the rewards do. Cool, and so, yes, let's do this. Um, quick little definition. So I talked about episodic tasks and continuing tasks. So episodic tasks are tasks that have a natural end. So we can describe them like a chess game as you start a game, in which case the board's reset, everything's where it should be, and then you play a game and at the end you get a result. And then the system restarts and you can go again but the defining, defin or the defining factors of such a problem is that it has a restart, which is somewhat known. It could be the board, or it could be that it's the ask, there's some variability in the start position, but generally it starts off from a start point, a reset point, and then it ends at a definitive point. It might be after a certain number of steps, it might be, for example, you can say, okay, I've got to solve a maze. So, you know, do I either, you know, do I go out the door? That's when obviously I've finished the maze. Or it could be, you know, the sun sets and you're outside in the middle of the maze field, in which case, you know, you need to go home. So the, this is an episodic task. And in which case your reward is finite. It's definitively finite. There is a finite end to the point where this process or this problem stops. However, we can do what's more common or what we focus on more commonly is control tasks. So you're trying to follow a trajectory, in which case it lacks a natural end. So for example, if, this, if the uh, action is driving a car, you can say, yes, the end is when I arrive at my destination, but that's not necessarily how we wish to define the problem. If we were to say, okay, the objective of this reinforcement of this agent is to arrive at destination, and define that as an episodic task, the problem becomes a lot more complex than, no, it's just to follow a specific traje uh, trajectory. So specifically, continuing tasks are these con tasks which we say there's no definitive end, you just sort of follow and do along what we tell you to, and maybe at some point we shut down, but that's not an important thing. In which case, if you try and sum up your reward and try and say, okay, right, I want to optimize this task, Naturally, some sort of optimizer will say, well, then let it run at infinity, and what I do is largely irrelevant. And so what we do is we introduce a discount factor, or this discounting term gamma. So what we do is we say, okay, the task is to, or the cumulative reward is defined as the reward that we receive at this point, plus a discount of the previous term, plus the discounted of the previous term. And you can mathematically define this in this sort of function. So we define gamma as the discount rate, and this is a value that varies from zero to one. From a numeric point of view, if gamma is equal to one, then all rewards are valued the same. They all have the same value to us, because at the end, they're all worth the same. And in that case, as the task continues, uh, your expected sum of returns tends to infinity. However, if you make gamma less than one, uh, then as k tends to infinity, or the number of events gets larger and larger, the uh, expected sum of rewards will remain finite. And it won't 
increase or decrease. It will generally stay within some bounded region. In fact, um, mathematically, you can quite easily prove that if we define it, the, our expected reward as the numerical sum of the discounted factors, then if the reward remains constant, we will limit and come out to some bounded value. And again, this is critical where you talk about when you talk about these things. Now, obviously, the choice of gamma has a big influence on whether or not or the behavior of your agent. So if a gamma is close to one, so as you increase the value of gamma, you have what's called a very far-sighted um, agent, which means that it might say, so for example, uh, to go back to a chess game, it might look into the future and say, winning the game is worth more than increasing the value of my position at this moment, because that's worth a lot. And so it'll make a decision based on that. If, however, gamma is very small, it might say, you know what, it's better that I take the small step and get to that immediate reward because that's what's important to me. And so again, this is another one of these parameters that is very important in how you design your reward. In the case of a maze, which might also be quite intuitive, it might be here I'm in a maze and my objective is to get out that door. Now, if I'm standing this side of the table, now obviously heading in that direction will get me the reward. However, if I walk against the table again and again and again, nothing changes. So that would be a very short-term form of reward. However, a long-term form of reward might say, say there was a blockage here, go in that direction, go around the room, and then leave. So these things do come into effect, into effect, and they do influence whether or not your agent will even come to a solution. Because you might be wondering, why does your agent keep bouncing against the wall? It, maybe it's not far-sighted enough. And that's also why some of us wear glasses. So that's a different, that's how we deal with essentially and avoid infinite reward functions. Okay, then, uh, yeah, 26, cool. Lastly, uh, so states, so that's the reward complex, but doable, manageable, get that experience. Um, states, so now we need to define states, just so we have a common point by which we can evaluate, or at least with, with which we can talk to each other afterwards. So environment state is, so a random variable, we use upper class to denote the um, uh, non-scalar multi-dimensional quantity, uh, sorry, the random variables, small symbols is a realization. So X large means the entire range, so the entire group set, whatever it happens to be. Small is that specific event. Um, so you have a realizations, a whole bunch of them, and this is an internal realization. So this is what the environment knows. So it's in a maze that would be your position. If you're driving a car, that's everything. The speed of the car, the position in the world, the position in the town, all of this information which naturally the environment has. So these are things which, as we say here, car velocity, your motor current, um, game states, chessboard situation, um, financial states, stock market states. So specifically, if you talk about the stock market, that, that environment state would be every stock that you can see as well as what's happening at any point in time. And so that's a critical thing, which is that this might be fully or limited, vis uh, limited uh, might be fully visible or limited uh, visibility to the agent. So in the case of a stock thing, you don't know what some guy on the other side of the world's buying. The environment knows, but you don't. That's a case of a sometimes or a foggy agent, uh, sorry, an unknown quantity. There's also foggy um, or unknown quantities. As I said, if you've got a sensor, you might be moving along at a speed. Now, obviously, the environment knows how fast you're working or you're driving because physics exists. However, your sensor or your wheel speed sensor might it might not have that resolution, it might not have that accuracy, it might also be damaged. And so there's always, there's a bit of stochastic process that can come through in the observations of the environment state. Um, and it could be a continuous quantity, so in the case of speed, we it could be, you could be driving at 24 or 25 kilometers an hour, 24.999. These, in a continuous state, these are differentialized. However, in a discrete quantity, that would be more akin to your position, say, in a chess match or the position in a maze. It's generally, or not a maze, uh, a chess 
board fits quite better for discrete fashions because a maze can become continuous depending on how you uh, go about building the maze. The agent state, so again, it's also a random variable with uh, realizations x of k. And this is the internal realizations of the representation of the agent at that point in time. So in general, the agent state doesn't necessarily represent the environment state uh, due to measurement noise, uncertainty, unknown quantities. And inside of that, there's con there could be condensed information relevant to the next action. Um, this could also be dependent on the policy. So the policy is the agent's way of making decisions. And again, continuous or discrete quantities. Then history, so the agent obviously has and knows these things, but now how do, how do we make these decision factors or how do we start trying to go about optimizing this? Well, we need a few further definitions. So history is the past sequence of ob all observations and rewards, so everything, entire thing. Obviously tr up to the current time step. Now, obviously, this is fairly data inefficient for, say, continuous tasks. However, for periodic tasks, it might be possible to have this information on hand. Therefore, we come across to um, an information state or a Markov state, which is a theorem where if you can define everything about your current state based purely off of what happened in the previous state, say the actions as well as the previous state events as well as your, all the information you knew about the environment, that is what you can be called, that is what can be called an information state or a Markov state. Or more specifically denoted that the um, pr uh, a state is called an information state if and only if the probability uh, function of coming to the next state from the previous state is the same or as can be defined as go, it's taken, going to the next step, taking into account all the previous steps. So that means all information is available, every bit of it, or at least as well as possible. Is that clear? Because th this is where things start to become a bit getting into the weeds. So if we can use that, you can start to sort of, so some people might start to say, okay, that's useful, because now we can start trying to do something useful with that. So, for example, these are more commonly known Markov or um, information states that we use commonly within uh, control engineering, um, specifically the linear time invariant state space model um, or the nonlinear time invariant state space model. Now, both of these are models which you can call Markov or information states, and in that all the information you need to describe the next state is contained within the data you have. So. That means, however, that there are degrees of observability. So there's full observability. <laughs> My apologies. There's full observability, which is the agent can see everything. So everything that the agent needs to see to make its decision is available in what it sees. So specifically, when you talk about driving a car, doesn't need to know what the motor current is that comes upon there. But at the very least, as long as it knows what its previous speed was, what its action was, so wheel position, throttle position, and it knows where it currently is, it can then make a decision about where it's going to go. So it doesn't need to know that 20 minutes ago it was driving out of the parking lot somewhere else. That's irrelevant to its current decision at that point in time. There's partial observability, which is the agent does not have full access to its environment state. So some states that we might need are, are not present. Um, in this case, you have a partial observable MDP. Um, and the agent may reconstruct some state information. So it might be possible. So this is where, say, the, mathematics, the mathematicians tend to lose their mind a bit, but those of us in control um, engineering and engineering in general are sort of like, okay, that's fine. Mathematicians, you want to know everything. Everything's got to be well defined. Engineers, sometimes you don't know everything. And so we might throw something like an observer or try and do something to fit the data to 
replace or create some indicator of that missing piece of information. So those of you, like this is where things like when you drive in a tunnel and your GPS can no longer receive the information of its location, there's an observer that tracks where the car is going in order to keep and update that map that you see in front of you. Specifically, if you're talking about self-driving cars, when your car loses that GPS information, it still needs to be able to know how to drive you out the tunnel. Otherwise, you're going to get some very interesting conditions when the GPS starts throwing errors under the, in the tunnel. And so, yeah, some, some other examples. A technical system with limited sensors, which happens often in industry. They cut costs. Um, poker games. You don't know what your opponents have. Yeah, you might... You know, maybe you've got you know, one of these RFID things, you've planted RFID cards, you've got the dealer on the bankroll or something like that, but you can't really know what the total system state is. So your agent has to make decisions on its poker, on what it does in a game of poker, based off of a limited number of information. And then also human health status, which is also a very interesting topic, um, where you, like to model a human system, doctors today still can't model it completely. It, the human system is a very complex system with lots of different interactions. However, it's possible for a computer, and they've done this with image, I think they, I can't remember where they've done it, but they were able to sort of start figuring out whether you have higher risks of cancer better than like a human can. As an example, I'm not too sure if it was specifically that, but they're able to improve diagnoses better than what doctors are able to do themselves because a computer might not understand the relationship between a slightly higher, say, iron level and maybe a protein. It won't understand what that means to the body, but if it's learned often enough that a higher level of this combined with that results in cancer, it can then say, hey, there's a higher chance of things. That's just an example of one of those sorts of partial observability states. Lastly, I think lastly, are we near there? Cool. Um, action. Action is the agent's degree of freedom in which it can maximize its reward. So here there's a few distinctions. Finite control set and continuous con action control set. So finite action set, there's a discrete number of actions that an agent can perform. So to go back to a maze, can go forward, backwards, left or right. That's it. There's no other way of interacting within the environment. So an agent has a limited number of decisions by which it can do it, and these are discrete points. Uh, and then you get also continuous action sets. So this is when there's a continuous range of actions. So when you drive in a car, a if you were to try and make that finite, that would be you either put the wheel straight, left, full, right, full, throttle through or, uh, or no throttle. That would be a way of discretizing a continuous action space. So continuous action space, you turn the wheel 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, you put the throttle 10%, 20%, 30%, and there's infinite degrees of freedom in between that. So that's a continuous action space. Now, yes, it's possible to discretize a continuous space. Whether you want to do that and the advantages and disadvantages, that's up to you and the essentially the control engineer's decisions. Um, it could be deterministic. It could also be random. So you could say, right, there's if when in this position, go left. Or you could say, do something random. We'll see an example of that soon. And yeah, so, OK, yeah. Uh, taking a car during a blackjack game, is that deterministic or random? Sometimes it might be you need to throw a bit of randomness in there. Maybe the two is hidden there that you need, or maybe you're going to blow the 21. Uh, driving an autonomous car, that, again, would be a continuous action space. Um, and then buying stock options. So generally, stock options are discrete. You either buy one, two, three stock options. But when you buy and sell them can be perhaps considered a continuous action set. So again, your problem, defining your problems, is very often a very important first step. So when you start off and you say, right, I want to choose an algorithm. I want to apply reinforcement learning to a problem. Going through everything that I've covered up to now, so is it a finite continuous action set problem or continuous action set problem? Is it episodic? Is it continuous? What's the reward function? How do I design these? These are things that you need to consider because you, how you define these problems and your, solution or your choices that you make in those initial few steps make a big difference to the solutions you will then try to apply to your problem. 
policy. This is where we start getting a bit into the weeds. Um, so policy or reinforcement learning in general is about improving our policy. A policy is the autonomous way by which a decision is made. So it might be something as simple as if, stand, if I'm standing in square, whatever it happens to be, then go forward. Or the policy might be a bit more complex based off of, say, an image processing system or something like that. The goal, our goal in reinforcement learning is to improve upon that policy to maximize our reward. So policy is just a generic blanket term we use to describe the decision-making process by which an action takes its observations and then provides us with an, uh, with an action. So deterministic policies, you take the state and you map it to a certain action. You can get to stochastic processes, which could be something like, you know, in the blackjack game as previously, if you see, you know, you've got blackjack, don't take a card. That's deterministic. There's an deterministic thing. However, you might say, okay, I've got a jack and a six. What's the chances of getting a five? And then you might do something stochastic in terms of your decision process. So for an, an example of a deterministic policy example is a PID controller, commonly seen within um, control engineering. In fact, 99% of control tasks can be solved with a PID controller. And in this case, the agent's behavior is explicitly determined by KP, KI, and KD. So over here, we have a policy and an agent. The agent sees some observation in the form of Y of K. It has obviously some trajectory. Uh, sorry, here's our Y of K, so here's our observation. It has some set point or trajectory which it's trying to follow. And from that, the agent takes all this information and then defines an action which is then applied to the environment. After a step, the environment responds and it updates our agent. So that is indeed, or well, can be considered an agent in terms of the context of what we have learned. So the agent's behavior is here explicitly defined. There's no randomness in what happens here. Depending on the, um, uh, depending on the observation, the action performs a very known function. That's very well defined and without any form of variability or stochastic process. However, a, a non-deterministic policy would be, a, well, sorry, a stochastic policy example would be either you know, a two-player game of rock, paper, scissors, or more complex and more famously known, rock, paper, lizard, scissors, Spock. Um, in which case, this is one of those examples where playing a deterministic policy might not work to your advantage. So if you always do the same move, like for example, if you, you know, you're playing poker and every time you see double ace, you go all in all the time, your, your opponents are gonna know what's happening. If you always go and you play rock because you've got a 90% chance of winning with rock in the, past, in the past, your opponent will know he just needs to counter with paper. So sometimes having a stochastic policy could be beneficial to our problem. And so that brings us essentially to everything that we started with in that initial picture. So remember a few slides back, I showed you the picture which showed the agent, the environment, the observation, and the actions. So from that, I've covered everything in that basic function. So now we're going to start moving into how do we go about, and so we're gonna do a few more definitions which help us to try and solve these problems. So the first one are value functions. So for here, we've got two value functions. The first one is what's called the state value function. So the state value function is an, the expected return from being in a state X following policy pi. So that means assuming a Markov decision process, we can say, okay, we've got a way of defining what the concurrent events are going to be. So we know following said policy, what the results, are, what the expected result is going to be. So this would be in the case, and we will have a look at this later. I, we will have a, uh, you, so you will get an intrinsic understanding of it. So here we just want to cover the theory. It's the expected return from being in current state following a current policy. An action value function is the expected return from being in the state for having t and then taking a specific action. So before, so, uh, so this is, you've got a, uh, you're going to take an action and thereafter what's the expected reward. 
So previously it was following a policy, here it is just simply you take an action. So the difference would be if I know I'm in this position and I know I've got that policy, I know certainly if I go forward or what's going to be how, what sort of reward or what's the expected return. We will get into a bit more, um, I will, uh, more concrete examples which will help to explain this because at the moment this is quite theoretical. And so key tasks in reinforcement learning is to estimate the value, the state value function as well as the action value function based on sample data and experience. Because let's get to those examples before I start confusing it. Um, yes, I think we will take a break sometime soon. Um, lastly, just a few small points before we take the break. Um, exploration and exploitation. This is common, at least in our everyday lives. We all know you travel off to a new country or somewhere, you go off on a new travel, go somewhere exotic, and you try a few different things. Now, after a while, you might come down to a decision and like, okay, do we want to go off and try some other restaurant? And, you know, you might eat something you're not really, that doesn't taste good to you, or do you want to go off to a McDonald's because at least you know what it tastes like? And sometimes, yes, it's worthwhile to do some exploration, to discover what the world's like out there. But, you know, sometimes you go off to a restaurant and it doesn't really taste that good. You know, so you don't have a good time. And so trying to decide whether you do exploration or exploitation is a common problem that we often have in reinforcement learning. Because by exploration, you discover where the boundaries are, but sometimes that's not really beneficial. So trading off when you explore, when you exploit, is another common tuning point that we use in reinforcement learning problems. Yeah, okay. And then just what do we mean by model? Um, a model predicts what will happen inside an environment. So that could be a state model, um, P. So that would be that what is the, mo that, and that's, so, Given that you're in a, specific, uh, in a particular point and you perform a particular action, what will be the expected next state? So it could be stochastic, it could be deterministic. A reward model is if you're in a particular point at a particular state and you take a particular action, what's the expected reward? Now both of these are, some, are, are similar, but they're still different. The one you find out what's the reward, what's the value of performing said action according to the said model, a reward model, is, as the state model, is where will you be if you take the action. And in general, these could be stochastic or deterministic. And some, yeah, using data to fit the model is called system identification and is its own machine learning or reinforcement learning problem by itself. But so model, the thing is model-based, you don't consider discrepancies. So when you do model-based, there's no discrepancies. You're not necessarily using um, past information to build up your model. So a model generally assumes based on whatever it happens to be. So you might say, okay, I've got a model of a car. I understand how the car drives. However, it doesn't take into account the discrepancies between it. So you might have, okay, I know how to drive a small little hatchback, and then we put you in, you know, like a Formula One car, and yes, it's a similar model, but you don't really know how to do it. And that's where model-based techniques fail to help you with those circumstances, but um, reinforcement learning, where you take that experience and you use that experience to update your internal models can help you out. And so that's everything I want to cover before lunch, uh, before lunch break. Um, are there any questions as to anything that we've covered up till now? We will go into a few examples on some of this. So specifically, I know the value function and the state value function and the rule. these things are confusing. They do get very confusing. That's why I say like, you will later on, you'll be using these concepts somewhere else in some tabular form in a mark of decision process. And you might want to pause the video, go back, okay, what was that? How did we define that? And so that's why we're approaching this from an inverted classroom lecture, uh, which using an inverted classroom structure to try and teach this information. So if there's no questions, I'd suggest a 15 minute pause. So get some water, have a little snack, and we'll continue at half past three. <laughs>